So Zer Shimshu for Parshas Bahar on page Kufchav Gimel in the middle of the page on the right side. The Odiyesh Pratim Acherim. What he's here is he's trying to answer the famous question of Rashi. Rashi asks why the parsha begins with instead of Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Lemor, which the Torah usually begins with, it says Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Bahar Sinai Lemor. It adds those words Bahar Sinai, and Rashi asks the question Ma Inyan Shmita Eitzel Har Sinai. What is the connection between Shmita and Har Sinai? In other words, why is Har Sinai mentioned? And Rashi only answers half the question. Rashi tells us to teach us that just like by Shemitah, as we see in the parsha, the Torah gives us the general ideas, but also gives us all the specifics. The Torah gives us very intricate and specific details. So too, when it comes to the rest of the Torah, we're supposed to derive that, um, that just like by Shemitah, from Har Sinai we were given both the general and the specifics, so too, at Har Sinai we were given both the general and the specifics. Which means that, for example, when the Torah gives us the mitzvah of uh, Tefillin, the Torah gives us one line. It just says, That's all the Torah tells us. The Torah tells us it four times, but it doesn't give any specifics. When the Torah tells us how to, um, uh, to build a sukkah, it just says, It doesn't tell us what the sukkah should be. Be made of and what the qualifications of a sukkah. So I, some people are under the false impression that the Torah just said make a sukkah and then the rabbis made up the rest. And so that's why the Torah says no. Bahar Sinai and the Torah gives us all these details to tell you that all these details trace back to Har Sinai. And that's Rashi's answer, which is a very important, very important, most basic principle within the Torah. But it doesn't answer the question for why did the Torah specifically choose Shemitah to make it this example. The Torah could have done this with any mitzvah, given generalizations and a lot of specifics with any mitzvah, and used the word Bahar Sinai with any mitzvah, and we would know this rule. Why was Shemitah chosen? So there must be some, and that's where all the commentaries come in, to try to explain the connection between the mitzvah of Shemitah and Har Sinai. And the Zereshimshan has a long, long Torah on this. We're going to pick up in the middle from page Kufchav Gimel. V'od yesh pratim acherim b'shemitah domim lahar Sinai. There's further connections between Shemitah and Har Sinai. And he explains like this. Shem yishmeru ha if the Jewish people would keep the laws of Shemitah, lo yihiyu golim me'artsam, there would be no exile. K'mo shahayu ha'shivim shana shal galus babel, the reason why we know, the reason why we were in exile in Babylon for 70 years in Babel, neged shivim shemitos shabatlu, to correspond with the 70 years of Shemitah that we missed. Which means the Jewish people were in Eretz Yisrael, from when they first arrived with Yahushua for about 900 years, 900 plus, but let's call it 900 years, the Jewish people. Of those, less than half the time they kept Shemitah. The, the majority of the time, and what we're told is by the time they went into exile, there was a total of about 490 years worth of years that they did not keep Shemitah, which would leave for about 70 Shemitahs. And that's why they went into exile for those 70 years where the land was left on, uh, uh, by fallow. And that would make up for the missed Shemitah years. And that's actually what it says in Parshas V'chukosai, that you'll go into exile. And Rashi there, and that Pasuk makes the calculation that that's the 70 years of exile. Yes. questions? We get multiple reasons why we went into exile. We are told... For instance, why the bias three shown? We went into exile because of Vodazar. Um, so, are these things mutually exclusive? Or are they? That's a, that's a really good question. From it seems from the commentaries, we went into exile for the first time because of the three cardinal sins: idolatry, adultery, and murder. The duration of seventy years was corresponding to the shemitas. And what does it mean when, to say that we didn't keep? Does that mean that one Jew didn't keep? Does that mean that r the rogue didn't keep? That's a really good question. Well, I don't know if we have an answer to that. I don't know if we have an answer to that. I would guess that based on the laws that we know, 
that um, the community is always punished after the rove. So I would I would guess that it would be a majority of the people were not keeping shemitah. That would be my my best guess, but I, I haven't seen that. Okay, <coughs> now, ukeshikarvu lahar Sinai. We know that when the Jews approached Har Sinai, kanu acherus. That's when they earned their true freedom. Kedichsev, as it says, charus al haluchos. The Torah uses the word charus with the luchos. Charus meshibad malchus, which was freedom from the exile, subjugation to the kingdoms. Which means, and we know this, when we talk about the four cups, we say vaotseisi vitzalti vigaalti velakachti. According to most of the Rishonim, Vahotseisi is when we stopped working, Vitzalti is when we left Egypt, Vigaalti is when we crossed the sea, and Vilakahti is when we stood at Harsina, Vilakahti Eschem Lilaam, I will take you for to be a people for me. Which means when we talk about the four languages of redemption, the completion <coughs> of the redemption occurred fifty days after. Uh, by Shavuos, mm-hmm. when, we, when we're going to say on Shavuos, by the Kiddush, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, it really is a Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. It's, it's really a commemoration because by Har Sinai we were truly free. Not just free from Egypt, but the way it was supposed to be was that Har Sinai, we were never going to be in exile again. Because even though we'd already gone officially free <coughs> from the first day of Pesach when we left Egypt in Kolzeh, <coughs> we weren't truly free. Because even though we were physically free of Egypt, we weren't spiritually free of Egypt. The Jewish people as a whole had to count seven clean days, which is what the Zohar says, that the seven weeks of Sphira are corresponding to the seven clean days that a Zav, Zava, or Nida would have to count to become purified. The Zohar tells us that that's the reason for the seven weeks of Sphira Zahomer. Now, Allah is that with a Zav, a Zava, and a Nida, Again, that's, that's for both men and women. The man when he's a Zav, and the woman when she's a Zav or Nida. There's actually, according to, um, uh, to some, not everyone agrees with this, but some would say that there's a mitzvah that the woman should actually count out loud. Today is day one, today is day two. And the same thing with the Zav. So even if that's not, the, uh, that, that's not what's done, but certainly by Sphir Omer, we count today is day one. Uh, of course, we're assuming that we're somehow clean. The Alshech explains like this. So the day 50 is the day when we go to the mikvah, spiritually speaking. That's when we became completely free. So um, the Shavuos is the celebration of the true freedom, um, spiritually speaking. So, of course, everyone can see where he's going with this. So Shemitah, which is also 7 times 7, is connected to Har Sinai in such a deep way, based on this. That's why the Torah chose, of all the mitzvahs, to mention Har Sinai, Shemitah and Yovel, Shem Chamishim Shana, which is 50 years, Neged Osama Chamishim Yom, corresponding directly to the 50 days of Sphiris Omer, whilst Kanu Acheris Olam, they received eternal freedom. Acheris Elyon, the supernal freedom, they were cleansed of their impurity. So this is so beautiful. He's saying that on the lowest level, you have a purity that comes from one week. That's true by Zav, Zavo, Nida. The truth is that even somebody who's come into contact with a dead body needs seven days of purification. A Mitzorah <coughs> needs seven days of purification. Uh, a woman who had a, uh, had a boy needs seven days of purification. There's, there's, that's the level, that's the, so base, the micro, the uh, right, that's the base level. When you have an entire people who need purification from the spiritual impurity of Egypt, there, that's what we're in Sphere Omer, that's seven times seven, reaching seven times seven um, days, meaning seven weeks, where we are reaching the spiritual purity uh, as a people to be freed of the deeper spiritual impurity of Egypt. And then you have the highest level, which is the Jewish people, 
in their whole lifetime who have the 50 years of seven years uh, cycles in order to achieve the... So those three, the seven days, seven weeks, and seven years are each higher level, one above the other, to achieve spiritual, spiritual perfection. He says, Yisrael Shandu al Sinai, Pascha Zuhamasan. When the Jewish people stood at Har Sinai, all their poison, the spiritual impurity within them, went away. Because the main spiritual poison comes from the first sin of Adam and Chava. Because it caused divisiveness and separation. <coughs> This is so beautiful the way he says this. And when we came to Har Sinai, the most important thing that happened at Har Sinai was Vayichan Sham Yisrael. The Jewish people camped there. And it should have said Vayachanu Sham Yisrael, which is the plural. They camped there. Instead it says Vayichan, which is a singular term. Amur Zala was sages derived from that. That it was Belevachad um, Kiishachad. It was with one heart, like one person. This was an incredible unification. Mishishim Riba of 600,000 people. Shahay Yushamu were there. And I've never seen anyone say this, but he says this, that it was also all the future souls. Now everyone knows all the future souls were there. But he's saying all the future souls also felt that unity. All of us. We're there, united with each other, with every other Jew that exists in the world today and that has ever existed. We were all Belev Echad Keish Echad. L'chein B'mitzvah Sayovel, that's why Yovel, which corresponds to that, Yovel corresponds to the 50 years when we achieved this level, Ksiv Deror Ba'aretz, the Chal Yeshva, a freedom in the land to all its inhabitants. <coughs> and a very interesting halacha. A very interesting halacha by it comes to Yovel. It's the exception to the rules of the Torah, and it causes a whole bunch of other exceptions. Do we keep Yovel today? We don't. And because we don't keep Yovel today, there's all kinds of things that we don't keep. There's uh, certain things that are only the, 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 the screaming about sh- uh, Shemitah and uh, all these other you know, things, whether they apply when Yovel. It doesn't apply. Why doesn't Yovel apply today? Because the halacha is that Yovel requires all the Jewish people living in Eretz Yisrael. Now there's a question whether you need a majority, but it seems that uh, once you have a majority of Jewish people living in Eretz Yisrael, we might, according to some opinions, be obligated to keep Yovel. And when we keep Yovel, that would... Not everyone agrees it's a majority, but uh, it seems that if we're we're getting there, but we don't have a majority yet, it's getting close. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting a majority in Eretz Israel for the wrong reason, because Jews in America are disappearing. That's not a good reason to get a majority in Eretz Israel, but... But it, it is approaching, and the, the, the rabbis are dealing with the question for that moment, that as soon as we hit the majority, we're going to have some major, major halachic issues. What are the others? Well, there's all kinds of mitzvahs that only apply when Yovel applies. Uh, the whole list of them. But, um, Would we know when Yovel is, actually? Well, we, we, that would be part of the debate. Would it start from when we start counting, or do we go back so to ancient days? and? This year? Uh, 577, according to a Turkish capitalistic person. Well, yeah, there's a debate halachically as to where, how Yovel works then. Yes. So, so when you talk about exiles, uh, so when, you, when you're exiled, there's a question of Yovel, right? Right. Um, so the first exile would have been the Egyptian exile, right? Right, but Yovel doesn't start till the Jews first enter Eretz Israel. So then, so then now you have, then, then we took the land. And then we had the uh, uh, Babylonian exile. Now that only lasted 70 years, right? Right. It, you know, when they, when they, they came back and they started, and there was no event, right? I mean, it, was, it wasn't as if they were, were <coughs> how should I put this? Um, certainly the Mashiach didn't come. Right. Um, and they just took up. Right, it was supposed to be, when they came back, it was supposed to be a big show, but we failed. 
But they, right. they just took up where they left off. Right. Okay. Now, now, we've been uh, out of Eretz Israel for... Uh, Close to 2,000 years. It's hard to count, but... Um, exactly. 1,900 plus years. Yeah. Okay. 1,900 plus years. Um, but I think we, we, we have this concept that we really <coughs> can't start doing the things related to our uh, return until the Mashiach comes, right? Well, technically, when it comes to some things, so for example, establishing a king, rebuilding the base of Mikdash, and things like that, there are those opinions who say that we would, we were, we will refuse to do it until um, Mashiach comes. But but, but Yovel is a technical thing. Once you have the majority, no, but they did it, it, it after the end of Babylonian exile. They, they did do these things, no, they right? They well, well, they had a what? Didn't they resume Shemitah once they returned? Right. Well, they did. The question is, did they resume Yovel? It seems they did. Let's let's assume that they resumed Yovel as well. This is all a big debate in the Gemara. The Gemara goes back and forth. When the Jewish people did come back after the first um, exile in Babel, did they have a majority? Was it the majority of the people? What about the other ten tribes? And all, This is all a discussion in the Gemara, a very complicated one. So the same issues would apply today. To rebuild the base of Middash. So once you had the base of Middash, I would assume you had the oil, no? No, no. This is a Yovel depends on the majority of people in the land. Oh, That's it, uh, right? Uh, what, yeah. what, does, what does the rebuilding of the base of Middash? Uh, what's what? What is the um, the conditions for rebuilding the base of Middash? Oh, that's another big debate. There's the Chuvas of the Chassam Sofer about this. You know, we would we require first that we become purified with the red cow? Do we need do we need a navi, which is what many say? I think the Rambam seems to suggest that that we would need a navi to rebuild the base of Mikdash simply because we don't know what we're doing. So we would need we would need God's help building base of Mikdash until we have Mashiach. Uh, we we wouldn't dare to try to uh, do this in, in case we get it wrong. Smicha? When would we reestablish Smicha? So uh, Eliyahu Navi can bring, back, can bring back, back Smicha because he has Smicha and he never died. Even today, so we need uh, Eliyahu. Well. In 1967, <coughs> there were people who were donating money to build the Isolation. I remember Listen, you have the Temple Institute today uh, who are who are trying to, but you know they're not backed by any major rabbanim. So, uh, and you you see this from the fact that they decided they're going to build a menorah and they couldn't do it according to halachic specifications, so they built their own version of the menorah. You know, okay, so that means we're not going to use it. Right? So, so that menorah that you see, you know, the famous menorah that they've built and put in the glass case, it's not kosher. Right? So. Why? It's not. Uh, it's not pure gold. It's just uh, layered in gold. And, oh. Yeah. I mean, they, they because they you can't really build a menorah because anything made out of pure gold without a miracle the uh, the staves can't hold themselves up because the weight, the, because the weight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Back to where he's going. So he says the yovel only applies when. All the Jewish people are in Eretz Israel. Let's call it all, whether the definition of all means the majority, but the technical um, term is when all the Jewish people are in the land. Why? Because we need to go back to Ishachad Belevechad in order to achieve the true freedom. So that's why when we are dispersed in exile, we can't can connect to Yovel in the same way we can connect to each other in the right way, which is why we can't connect to true freedom in the right way. We can't keep Yovel, which is 50, because it, we can't correspond well to the 50th day, which is the Jewish people were united. But the lowest level, which is the seven days, no haggis, that applies. That applies even if you don't have a majority on the land. Because the poison didn't come back. That goes away. You can have, a, you can have the seven day purity without all the unity. But the Shemitah is a preparation. It's all working on those sevens, the Mehera Yibana Beis Amikdash, because may it be soon that the Beis Amikdash will be rebuilt. And the exiles will be gathered in. And we'll be able to keep Yovel. Because every day we await your salvation. So again, let me repeat this, because it's 
<coughs> it seems to be making a lot of different points, but there's one basic idea here. The reason why the Torah chooses to connect Har Sinai to Shemitah is to tell you that what we are working on with our Shemitah is to try to achieve some level of connection to work our way up to the 50, which is the complete freedom, which is what we did when we were approaching Har Sinai, when we spent the seven days times seven, seven weeks, trying to achieve that true freedom. Shemitah and Yovel is a bigger version. It's a um, grander version of what we're doing during these 50 days. And he says, because Harsina was meant to achieve the level of Ayich and Sham Yisrael, the level of unity, which is what allows the Jewish people to be fixed, so therefore Yovel accomplishes that on a greater level, but it requires all the Jewish people together to be able to do that. He says, with this you can explain the verse. This is a verse in Parshas B'chukosai. The land will abandon them will be abandoned by them. Basically referring to the world, the earth, Eretz Yisrael, will then have its Shabbos. It will have its rest. And again the verse says, then the earth will receive all its days of rest from all the days of its, of its um, desolation. As Tishbas Aretz, where it says, as Shabbosel, call him Yesham Tishbash, as Shabbosel, Shabbosel, Shabbat Chamalau, the verse says it over and over again that the earth will have its time of rest. Vikasha. So he says, I have a question. Halo imi yigalu Yisrael me Arza. If the Jewish people are going to leave Aretz Yisrael, Tia Aretz Masura, Bayado Oivim, won't the enemies take over? Vim Yavdu Akarka, Bishmit in the Biyoflos, they'll work it. Day and night. They'll work it on Shemitah and on Yovo. Mm-hmm. So how, why is Hashem saying that the land's going to have a break, the Shabbos, and have a rest? Then the earth will rest. Mm-hmm. He says, basically, uh, it's a great question. Hashem says, I'm going to give the land to your enemies, and they are going to sit there in your place, and then the earth will have its rest. No, it won't. They'll work it all the time. Everyone knows the answer to this question. Mm-hmm. But look at the perspective that he's saying. The Torah told you this three and a half thousand years ago. That the Torah says, when you're out of the land, nothing is going to grow. Right? It says that in the Torah. The Gemara in Gittin tells us, that Yanai the king had 600,000 towns or cities in Har HaMelech. Each one of those 600,000 towns had as many as those who left Egypt, which would mean 600,000 families and 2 million people. Chutz Mishlosha, except there were three larger towns, Shayubam, Kiflam, Kiyotzim, Mitzrayim. That's what um, um, the, uh, the Gemara says. So there was this heretic who heard Rabbi Hanina say this, and he says, Shakri Mashkarisu, you're a bunch of liars. I've been to Eretz Yisrael, I've been to Har HaMelech, and the Amar Ula, Ula himself said, I went to look at this place. That space couldn't hold 600,000 reeds. Cities, not towns. Cities, yeah, you want cities, large cities. That space couldn't hold. He says, The heretic called us a liar. You say, How could you say that there were 600,000 cities in a place? I've been there now. It's an empty field. What are you claiming there was uh, half a million cities in this place? Amar lay, so the rabbi, Reb Hanina, answered to the heretic, Ksiv ba Eretz Tzvi. Eretz Yisrael is called Eretz Tzvi, the land of the deer. According to most, Tzvi is a deer. Why? Ma Tzvi ze in oro machzik as besaro. Because if you skin a deer, you can never wrap that skin around the carcass of that deer again. It will shrink. 
and it will never be as big. Even if you get machines to stretch it out, it'll just stretch. It'll thin out. <coughs> so how does that make sense? But HaKadosh Baruch Hu made an animal that we should see that that's the way that the land works. In Oro Machsikas Besaru, their skin is just not enough to cover all their body, their flesh. Af Eretz Yisrael, the land of Eretz Yisrael, Bizman Sheyoshu Malah, when the Jewish people are dwelling on it, Ravcha, there's more space. In Yoshu Malah, when the Jews leave Gamda, it shrunk. Ad Kam Gemara, that's what the Gemara says. That we have not, you think you've done a tour of Eretz Yisrael? You've done nothing. You are seeing a shrunken version of Eretz Yisrael. The Im Kain. Uh, this is unbelievable. Kishain Yisrael ba'aretz nikas shvisa la'aretz. The land is at rest. Shaharei lo nishar mimena elachelik ma'at mizeir because we are barely getting a portion of Eretz Yisrael. Ba'ashar na'lemes v'niskases Eretz Yisrael. The rest of it is hidden away from us, which means then, according to the Zera Shimsha, according to the Zera Shimsha, when Mashiach comes, or even before that, if, according to some, if the Jewish people would pick themselves up and on Kamfei Nisharim, the majority, and go to Eretz Yisrael, we would have to rewrite the map. That's what he's saying. Eretz Yisrael would be a different size. It only looks like it's this size. So when we talk about right now, you could travel from the eastern border to the western border in 45 minutes from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, when the majority of the Jewish people will be there, you might need 40 hours to get across the country. So are you implying not just by, you know, war or kicking out Palestinians, you're implying... That's exactly, that's exactly what I'm saying he says, because the land itself shrunk, and we find... Um, furthermore, he says... And this is, therefore, the land is at rest. The land is at rest because we don't even have access to the major, vast majority of Eretz Israel. But so oh, and furthermore... The Zerah Shimshon should be hidden away from these negotiations. Maybe. 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 Besides that, even what's left, even the land that we do have, it simply does not give fruit. While the Jewish people were there. Which means, first of all, most of our Israel is hidden away. And even what we have, it's just not going to grow while the Goyim were there. And it's, that means this is another place where the Torah makes, according to the Zerah Shemshon, makes a bold prediction and that we, 2,000 years later, know that it's true. We have Mark Twain traveling through Eretz Yisrael. And he writes, he says, what are these people fighting over? Thousands of years, everyone's fighting over this dust bowl. There's nothing growing here. They're trying. There's nothing growing. It didn't, nothing grew for thousands of years. And then the Jewish people came back, and just like that, it's growing. And the Zerah Shimshon is saying, it's not even growing. When we talk about what the land was like when the Jewish people were there, when there will be a majority. And so Hashem is saying that in His Torah. Hashem says, when you are thrown out of the land, the land will rest, nothing will grow. He continues. But there's, he goes into a more positive approach. There's another point which makes Shemitah connected to Har Sinai. We know the seventh year brought blessing um, to the sixth year. It would actually grow on the sixth year. It would grow too much. I spoke to someone who told me that actually they're having trouble in Eretz Yisrael because during the sixth year, all the people who are keeping Shemitah, they, their, their fields grow so well today. They grow so well in the sixth year that it's causing too much supply oh, and lowering the prices over the sixth year because they're not they're, they're not um, you know 
hiding it away, they're just right. making it available, that's lowering the prices and hurting the economy. Because all the people who are keeping Shemitah, their stuff grows better during the sixth year and they have more. And this is a problem that they're facing as more and more Jews, we should always have such problems, as more and more Jews are keeping Shemitah and it's a growing trend, it's not growing fast enough. Um, but, but there are a lot of... Uh, I mean, if you go back to the uh, 1930s when Rav Cook went around trying to convince farmers, at that point they thought he was, he was, everyone thought that he was out of his mind to think that he could convince these, and that it, the majority of people didn't um, why, why keep don't the they laws have of to Shemitah. store it away if they're keeping Shemitah? Well, they, they do, but there's just so much supply available that uh, the prices are, it's hard to maintain the price. I guess the rules for how they're regulated are, are not quite as... Uh, um, the farmers normally uh, do not hold on to the excess stuff. The right. wholesalers, they have the facilities like refrigerator and the special places to hold on to it. So they may get the profit, not the farmer. Right. So there's, they have to deal with this issue. And, you know, we should, we should deal... Aristotle should always deal with the problem of having excess. Although it is a problem sometimes, you have to deal with it. But, but he's saying that, that, that there's a special bracha that comes because Hashem provides in the sixth year. I'm just saying we can taste it. V'chein yil asid lavo, so will be in the future. Because I mean in peri gimud gimel dixubas, loko olam azeh, olam ava, then in the future, olam azeh yishpatzah lidruch v'livtzah. While we are in this world, we have to deal with, um, you know, um, Threshing and harvesting the grapes. Oh my God, but in the future, other maybe another aches bekar in the besvina, it'll just be big giant grapes. And in fact, the beginning of creation was supposed to be this way. Lule chet Adam, were it not for Adam's sin, Adam la'amal yulad, that man was created to toil. That the way it was supposed to be was that all this work would get done on its own. When we say get done on its own, it would mean that there would be people in the world who would be serving all the Jewish people, and they would be taking care of our needs, and we will be like the priests, the whole people. Atem tiuli mamleches kohanim, you will be for me a kingdom of kohanim. The kohanim weren't supposed to do work, they weren't supposed to have regular jobs, they were in the service of Hashem, and the people took care of them, but unlike, it wasn't charity, they performed the service, this was a service and they were taken care of. So the Gemara says, mm-hmm. the earlier pious ones, who the Torah was their job, their work was done on their own. But we know Adam Rishon sinned, and I talked about this on Wednesday night at length, if you get a chance to listen to the recording. As it says, by the sweat of your brow, you, sh- you shall eat bread, which means he was punished that the bread no longer came on its own. We have to do all this work. <laughs> but the Gemara tells us in Brachas, if we go back to doing what we're supposed to do, then Hashem will find people to work for us. The strangers will come and they will shepherd your sheep, which means when the time comes, when Mashiach will come, there will be pilgrims from all over the world who will be coming on mission to come and work for the Jews for the chance to have some spiritual definition in their lives. And they will work our fields and care for our vineyards so that we can all sit and listen to Shiurim from the Zerah Shemshan himself. I, I just, in in uh, 2010... <coughs> We were in Israel, and we went to Har HaBracha, uh, uh, and there is a, 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 an Orthodox-run uh, vineyard up there. It only produces um, wine for it, uh, use in Israel. It doesn't export. And <clears throat> the head of the vineyard uh, uh, has a picture of people working in the fields for his, you know, locally distributed wine, and none of the people who are working in the field are Jewish. They're from Tennessee and Georgia. And um, and I asked him if, uh, was this a one-time thing? He says, no, they come every year because they think it is their duty to help the Jewish people um, harvest <coughs> grapes. Wow. So. 
Okay, so it could be that they might have some ulterior motive. By that, by I asked by that him I mean about for that. Their, he said he for their spiritual, so, for their spiritual uh, account, uh, religion. Uh, but but the idea is still the big meaning right, because right. they feel that yeah. in order to help mm. bring about their salvation. But but the idea is already there that they're already picking up that that's really their role. That's their job. People are supposed to come. Yeah. We're going to skip a paragraph. When we stood at Har Sinai with one heart, like one person, at that point, that's the way it was going to be. We were going to go to Eretz Yisrael with the Torah, and we were going to study the Torah and serve Hashem basically all day long, and the nations of the world were going to come and do our work for us. The Torah was given for people who don't need to work, because the month falls for them. And by we know with the laws of Shemitah, that even what grows on its own, everything becomes Hefker. On the next page, let's see if we can fit this in. The Yaakov tells us, Why was the Torah given in the Midbar? That the Torah is free for everyone to take. Whatever was given on Har Sinai is like Shemitah. So he's saying, again, this amazing idea. Har Sinai is, Har Sinai is Yovel. The seven days were a Shemitah. And just like by Shemitah, there's all this blessing that comes during the sixth year representing, uh, meaning that, that allowing us the Shemitah year to focus on our service of Hashem and all our needs taken care of, that's the way it's supposed to be when the Jewish people arrive at Har Sinai. That was for them going to be the opportunity to sit in the service of Hashem while the man falls from heaven and the nations of the world are providing for all their needs. So... Um, Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll just close this off here. So he's saying that when it comes to Shemitah, the way that um, our needs are provided for for Shemitah is that it's available for everyone to take. The Torah also works like that. The Torah is available for everyone to take. And if we're talking about the Jewish people needing to be Osim Ritzon Makom, we have to be fulfilling the, the will of God in order to merit this, this level where the world is providing for us, where the earth itself is providing for us, that that, that level can be achieved when each of us um, approaches the Torah in this way. So just as a motivation, he talks about this more, but we're going to end here as a motivation before we're coming to Shavuos. Mitzvah Hashem, next week we'll have an official uh, pre-Shavuos Zerah Shimshin class. But where we're, we're approaching Shavuos, we have to realize that um, the Torah is available for all of us. <coughs> in order for us to receive the Torah, we have to go into the field and we have to collect those fruits and we have to make ourselves available to receive the bracha which comes. May we be zerucha to a true Kabbalah Torah through a purification of the seven times seven and achieve 50 days to the point where all of Kal Yisrael will come to Eretz Yisrael and live in Yovel in the Eretz Yisrael which is going to be many times greater as the Zer Shimshon describes and we'll be zerucha to the Olam Abba with all of its good things. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.